Hi and welcome back to the course on principles of business information systems. Today we will try to understand software systems and application software. So the objectives or principles of this chapter are systems and application softwares are critical in helping individuals and organizations in achieving their goals. It means that we will understand the overall importance of systems and applications and how they can add value to your organization and how can you maximize the profit using the right applications and systems for your organization. Do not develop proprietary application software unless doing so will meet a compelling business need that can provide a competitive advantage as compared to your competitors in the market. Now uh, choose a programming language whose functional characteristics are appropriate for the task at hand. Consider the skills and experience of your programming staff. So if we are getting any application developed, we'll have to make sure that the programming language which is used for your application, you have the desired staff for that available in your office so that in future if you want to make any changes to the system, your staff can understand the programming language and they can make the necessary changes to the program. The software industry continues to undergo a constant change. Users need to be aware of the recent trends and issues to be effective in their business and personal life. So if we are running a business, we must be uh, updated about the latest softwares which are there for that respective uh, niche of the market where you are operating so that you can incorporate the best softwares and programs which are available in the market. Now we have software. Software consists of programs uh, that control the working of a computer. And a computer program is a sequence of instructions for computer. Two type of uh, software are there, system software and application software. But computer programs, as they are saying, they are sequence of instructions for program. Whenever we are buying any program, it usually comes with the documentation. We describe the program functions which help the user to operate the computer system. Now, these kind of documentations uh, appear in different ways. For example, sometimes you can get the documentation online from their website. Sometimes there are videos available and sometimes it comes in the printed format. Now, uh, when we consider any software or a program, there are two kinds of software, which is a system software and an application software. Now, the system software is a software or an operating system which we use on our computer like Windows 10, Windows 7, Windows 11, or whatever operating system that you are using in your organization is a set of programs that controls the computer hardware and acts as an interface with the applications. So in order to run any application or in order to install any application on your computer, you must first have an operating system which we call a system software. Now whenever we are buying any application for that later, we'll have to make sure that the uh, operating system is compatible or the application is compatible with the operating system. Otherwise, you'll have to upgrade all operating systems in, in your organization. Most business people don't re uh, really care about the operating system as long as the system is easy to use and useful, they are happy. Uh, um, they usually buy the softwares or the applications which run smoothly on cross platforms. It means that regardless of the operating system that the application should be working perfectly fine without having any glitches and it should add value to the company itself. It still is useful for managers to know a little about the system software does so they can make informed choice when choosing the operating system uh, the business should see uh, or the business should use. Now the manager's responsibility is to decide that which kind of operating systems and softwares that they'll be using now or in the future and based on that they'll decide that which kind of operating system must be used in their organization. Now, ease of use, cost, and the security are just some of the things managers should concern with. So, uh, the managers uh, should not be concerned about too much about the overall security of the system itself. Their responsibility is to make sure that the system works perfectly fine with the employees with their day-to-day -day activity. Now, we must keep in mind, since they are talking about system software and application software, system softwares are, for example, the softwares that we have on our smartphone, tablets, computers, personal computers, 
ورک اسٹیشنز اور آپریٹنگ سسٹمز ایٹسیٹرا ویئر ایز وین دے ٹاک اباؤٹ دی ایپلیکیشن سافٹ ویئر دیز آر دی سافٹ ویئرز وچ وی یوز ان آرڈر ٹو اینہینس دی اوور آل پروڈکٹیوٹی آف دی آفس جسٹ لائک ورڈ پروسیسنگ ڈاکیومنٹس وی یوز مائکرو سافٹ ورڈ فار دیٹ اسپریڈ شیٹس ڈیٹا بیسز اور اینی گرافکس ایڈیٹنگ سافٹ ویئرس لائک وائز ان این انٹرپرائز انوائرمنٹ اف ویل کنسیڈر اے سسٹم سافٹ ویئر ویل تھنک آف دی سرور آپریٹنگ سسٹمز اور دا مین فریم آپریٹنگ سسٹمز اینڈ اف ویل ٹاک اباؤٹ دی انٹرپرائز ایپلیکیشن سافٹ ویئر وی نو دیٹ دیئر آر لاٹس آف بگ سافٹ ویئرز اویلیبل فار پے رول ڈیٹا اینٹری ہیومن ریسورس مینجمنٹ انٹرپرائز ریسورس پلاننگ سسٹمس سو دے فال ان دا کیٹیگری آف ایپلیکیشن سافٹ ویئر Like as we covered in chapter number three, a system software performs common computer hardware functions. It provides user interface. It provides a degree of hardware independence. Then we have manage uh, system memory, etc. Then it manages the processing task. It provides the networking ca- capability, control panel, system resources, etc. And then there is a kernel of the system. That's the heart of the operating system, which controls the most critical processes which goes on in a system software. Now, if we'll talk about the common hardware functions, the main functions of a hardware is it gets the input from the keyboard or mouse, etc., which are the input devices. Then it can retrieve the data from the disk. It can store the data on the disk or the storage, and it can display the information on the monitor. Now, as you can see, there are two kind of images over there. This one is indicating a command prompt through which we can pass certain commands to the computer, whereas the other one is talking about the overall graphical user interface of the computer. So we can get the input from the keyboard, input mouse, and other input devices. It can retrieve the data from the disk. It can store the information on the disk and display the information on monitor. It also provides a user interface. Two common types are graphical user interface through which we can easily interact with the program. Just like if we are using any Word sheets, Excel, PowerPoint, and all those things, we can easily uh, define a presentation or work on an Excel sheet or draft the document in a graphical interface. Command line interface where the commands must be typed at a prompt. For example, if we want to get some information about the IP address and rest of the details about the computer, overall connectivity, and some of the other features related to the partitions and stuff, we usually do it through the command line interface. Now in system software, we have task number two, which is memory management, where the computer itself manages the overall RAM, which is consumed by the computer and the other processes which are running in the computer. Now, uh, the software applications are designed to run on a particular operating system by using the operating system's application programming interface, which we call as API. Now, the processing tasks are the tasks which are there on the computer, which uh, um, are uh, running in the background, and we use it for different uh, operations in the computer. Now, the main responsibility of uh, processing task or task management software is that it lets the user run several programs, and then it prioritizes the, uh, the priority of the software that which one is required first and which one is required later. Some of the programs requires more memory than the other, so it's the responsibility of the task manager to make sure that all tasks are running in parallel without having any conflicts with one another. Another main responsibility of processing task is that there are lots of uh, um, programs and applications which are running in the background, but we cannot see just like if we are printing any documents or if other users are connected to your computer. So all those different tasks which are running in the background, the foreground programs are the ones which you can see, but there are lots of operations which are taking place at the back end. Now, it's the responsibility of the task manager to make sure that all users who are connected to that computer remotely or if you are connected to the same computer at the same time can perform different operations at the same time. Here, a concept of st- uh, scalability comes in as well. For example, if you have an Excel sheet where the other guys on the same network are entering the data on the same computer, they can all connect to the same computer and c- they can utilize the resources of that computer remotely. So the concurrent usage of the computer where all users can uh, maximize the overall productivity of the computer is called scalability. Now, networking capability means that the computer is connected to the network either through the network interface card or through the wireless network card. Now, the main benefit of that is that you are connected to the network resources where you can print the documents, you can uh, reach the storage, you can uh, open the files, you can share the files. 
Now, in the offices or the place where you don't have the uh, the network interface card or the you don't have the uh, cables, etc., in the offices or the LAN, there you can use the wireless network and can connect to the same network. And most of the other fa facilities like printing, uh, sharing the documents, and rest of the things are available on the wireless network just like you have it on a normal LAN. Now, access to the system resources means that the uh, system should provide access to different resources on the computers to different users, but make sure that there is no unauthorized access to that computer. That comes in file management as well because there are uh, several shifts in the office and sometimes the same computer is used among different users or it is being shared between the two users. So if one user is logged into the computer, his data should remain uh, private and uh, secure to his username and password, whereas if the, any other user would log into the same computer, he must have his own set of desktop, my documents, and rest of the things which is separate to each user. So that's overall responsibility of the operating system to make sure that it should protect the files which are uh, required for one user, and then it will protect the files which are required by the other user. So every user would have its own set of rights, permissions, and security policies through which the users keep their resources, documents uh, private and separate from the other users who are using the same computer. Now we have different common operating systems, which is uh, from Microsoft, from Apple, and Linux operating system. Of course, Microsoft is a paid software. We will have to pay for that. Apple is also a paid operating system, and uh, usually we need to uh, to purchase the uh, hardware or the software with that, and you, it comes with that. And then we have Linux available as free as well as at paid program. Now, most of the uh, PCs around the world, as they are saying, 90% of all the PCs running are Microsoft operating systems. They various versions and editions of Windows are also available. Now, since it's the widely acceptable operating system available in the world, uh, most of the application softwares which are available in the market are focused for Windows. So there is a big market for the softwares which are available for Windows and you, and you can easily buy them from the market. Now, the second one is Apple computer operating system. It is popular in the field of publishing, education, graphics, art, music, movies, and media, etc. So wherever you'll see, if people are working on publishing documents or graphics or editing or video editing, etc., mostly they are using Apple operating system since it works really good with multitasking and rendering the videos, etc. if you are into uh, publishing the uh, content on the internet. Then we have Linux operating systems. Linux is an op open source software. Open source means that its source code is available to the public and um, there are constant updates available for that. It has a huge uh, uh, support available on the internet for the support, etc. since there are open forums and if a person is facing a problem in an operating system, they can post a message over there and they can get an easy support uh, uh, using those channels. Now, uh, the open source software means that it is free and anyone can use the program, although most users would not want to use the free softwares because they want uh, to be secure and they want to make sure that the operating system which is provided by a vendor is protected and there are constant releases and update patches available for that. So there is no problem of the overall security and the confidentiality of the data. Now, these common operating systems are uh, used for personal uh, usage on the computers at home and in offices. But if we are working in an enterprise environment, in an office, etc., there are other operating systems which are used for the productivity and uh, overall utilization by other users. These support high-end network usage, data storage requirements, and data processing speeds. For example, Windows Server performs a host of tasks that are vital for websites, corporate, and web applications applications, etc. So if you want to um, have a web server, if you want to have a website hosted within your organization, you'll use a Windows server. If you want to maintain the accounts of the users on the network, again, we'll use the Windows server. And if we are using any kind of storage, etc., for that purpose also, we use Windows server operating system. Then we have Unix operating system, a powerful operating system designed for microcomputers and obsolete term meaning uh, a computer slightly less powerful than a mainframe computer, but still it is very secure and used for the enterprise environment. 
Uh, NetWear used to be an old uh, network operating system. It's not used that much. Then we have Red Hat Linux servers available, which is a Linux uh, works in the Linux network. Um, it is a very powerful operating system to be used on an enterprise environment. Then we have Mac OS X server, which is a server operating system from Apple. Now, just like uh, new, um, new mainframe computers provide the uh, computing and the storage capacity to meet massive data processing requirements and offer high-end performance and excellent system availability, strong security and scalability, uh, scalability, et cetera. So all of these enterprise operating systems, they provide the high performance uh, uh, per computing and availability plus the security, et cetera, because on a normal PC, we'll be running uh, basic operations where a couple of users will be connected to the PC, but when it comes to the servers, uh, they are meant to uh, uh, to withstand the heavy load since all of the users will be communicating the servers in order to get their credentials authenticated or to get the files which are shared on those servers or to render different services which are provided by those servers. A wide range of applications of software have been developed to run in the mainframe environment, making it possible to purchase the softwares to address the most business problems. Then enterprise operating systems are for these mainframes, for example, ZOS, um, OS from the IBM, which makes it easier and less expensive for the users to run large mainframe computers. It is for huge, huge organizations which are uh, doing some uh, certain uh, computation, calculations, and then they are perform performing certain certain simulations on their computers. IBM mainframe computers are used for that purposes. Then we have MPEIX, which is uh, um, HP UX or the uh, Linux operating systems, which are used for the enterprise environment as well. So after the enterprise environment, we have mobile operating systems. These are also called embedded operating systems because they are typically embedded within a device, phone, or a digital camera. For example, if we have uh, Palm OS uh, devices, uh, or we have Windows embedded, Windows mobile devices, or Android devices. There are lots of different operating systems available uh, for them. Uh, we used to have it for Nokia as the Symbian operating system. For Windows mobile, we have its own operating system. Android is used in uh, most of the devices these days. And then we have op Apple itself operating system available. In most of the tablets and mobile phones, we have available operating system as Android or iOS. Now, since these devices are small and they have the touch capability within themselves, so these operating systems are designed in a way so that the users can maximize the profit of these devices. Now, most of the uh, these devices these days have replaced the, uh, the requirement of the computer. So most of the functions that we can perform using the computers are also available in these handheld devices. Now we have utility programs. Utility programs are the programs that help to perform maintenance or correct problems with the computer system. Now, hardware utilities are there, first of all, in the utilities section. Now, you might uh, uh, have seen these software such as uh, Symantec or Norton Utilities, etc. These are the hardware utilities which can check the status of all parts of the PC, including the hard disk, memory, modems, speakers, and printers, etc. Um, they help us in early detecting if there are any problems with those or if they need to optimize the disk with removing the extra files or the files which are not required. So it helps us in maintaining the overall health of the computer. Then we have virus detection and recovery utilities. Now, virus detection and recovery utilities protects us from any kind of virus. They are usually connected to the main server. So if there is a, a new outbreak, they'll automatically update its definition so that it keeps you protected against any kind of latest uh, variants of the viruses. Now, they have certain uh, recovery utilities as well. So if your computer fails and if you have a backup, you can use those disks in order to remove the viruses from your computer or restart the computer in a recovery mode to back up the files which you, um, to restore the files which you have backed up earlier. Next, we have file compression utilities. File compression utilities are available both in Windows, uh, both Windows and Mac operating systems. You might have heard of WinZip or uh, WinRAR, etc., uh, which are the best tools in order to compress the files. Uh, now, for example, if you have lots of files together, Word documents or Excel sheets or PowerPoint files, and you want to send it in one go, you can compress all those files and you can send them directly via email to, uh, to the recipient. 
On the other side, if you have any audio files or video files, and if you want to compress and reduce the size of it, file compressing utilities help us in that as well. Then we have spam and pop-up blocker utilities. Now, spam and pop-up blocker utilities are two different things where spam is protecting us from any kind of spam that we are receiving through email. So it's kind of an email filters which identify this spam by learning uh, what the user co um, considers a spam and routing it to the junk folder. So you can define your own rules that these are the uh, good emails which you want to receive. And if you are constantly receiving any spam, you can set alerts for that and they'll be sent to the trash can or they will be deleted automatically. Now the blocker, uh, uh, the pop-up blocker are the utilities which are usually installed on the browsers, which helps us from um, uh, getting any kind of pop-ups from the websites. Now we have network and internet utilities. For example, it monitors the hardware and network performance and trigger an alert when a web server is crashing or a network problem occurs. So these are the utilities which keep an eye on the overall functions of the different applications that we are using on the network. As soon as it detects that there is a network problem or if a server is performing low or they are losing connection to the storage, etc., it, it would trigger an alert so that the administrators can take appropriate action on that. Now that helps us in having high availability of the applications and uh, to avoid any kind of problems to run our business operations. Now server and mainframe utilities are the utilities which are used in order to perform functions in a huge network environment where we have lots of features and facilities available on these computers. Now, these kind of servers are sometimes available in virtualized environment. Again, the same kind of virtualization is available on Windows and Mac operating systems. In Windows, we use different free softwares and paid softwares and some uh, uh, programs like Hyper-V are already available in Windows through which we can virtualize the environment. In a Mac operating system, you can install Windows Parallels in order to uh, run the virtual machines on your computer. Now we have middleware. Middleware is a software that allows different uh, systems to communicate and exchange data with each other. So if they are running different operating systems, different applications, maybe you'll have a one uh, system where some applications will be loaded on Linux operating system, whereas there will be some systems which would be using Windows applications. So middleware helps them to communicate easily using the standard protocols and all applications can talk to each other. It can also be used as an interface between the internet and the older or what we call legacy operating systems. Legacy software is the previous major version that continues to be used. Any system which is not released or uh, for which there are no updates available by the vendor, those kind of operating systems are used legacy systems. Now, legacy systems are important in some organizations because maybe the system is working perfectly fine and you don't want to change it because you are heavily dependent on that operating system. So you'll have, to, uh, you'll have to use the old operating system and the application which is running on that. Now, sometimes you don't need to upgrade the operating system because if you'll upgrade the operating system, maybe these legacy applications would stop working. As a rule of thumb, it's always recommended to get rid of any legacy applications which are working in your organization so that in future, if you are making any changes, these legacy applications should not be a bottleneck for you. Middleware can be used to transfer a request for information from corporate customers to the corporate websites, to a traditional database or a mainframe computer, and return the results to the computer through the internet or using the applications which you have developed within your own organization by custom-made programmers or the custom-made applications using different programming languages, which we'll cover later in this chapter. Now we have application software, application software or applications give people, work groups and the entire enterprise the ability to use or solve the problems and to perform specific tasks. When you need the computer to do something, you use one or more application programs. Users are more concerned about application software than the system software because different organizations use different applications in order to maximize the overall profitability or in order to make the things easy on day-to-day -day tasks. For example, if you have a logistics company, they have lots of items which are coming and going and then you'll have to track the items which are received, which are sent, which are sent to the warehouse, which are delivered to the users. So the applications that we use in order to manage all that data, they are called the application software. 
Now, after the application software, we have the overview of application for uh, software. For example, a company can develop one of a kind program for specific applications. This is proprietary software, is not the public domain. You can't walk into a shop and buy it. So in order to define a proprietary software, it's one of a kind software designed for a specific application and owned by a company organization or a person that uses it. So the proprietary softwares are usually not available uh, for everyone. They are meant for the specific purposes uh, which are custom developed by the co uh, companies and they are used for their specific purposes. For example, the software that we use in, um, in any smart televisions, for example, if it is on the uh, Samsung smart TV, it is meant for that uh, uh, specific uh, LCD or LED screen and it shall be used by those screens only. Even if you'll get the software and would try to install it in any other LCD or LED or OLED, whatever the technology you are using, these kind of proprietary software simply does not work on those. Alternatively, a company can purchase an existing software program called off-the-shelf software because they can be literally be purchased off-the-shelf in, um, in a shop. They are available for everyone to be used because these kind of software which are off-the-shelf are designed in a way that anyone who belongs to a specific kind of a business can use it. For example, as we gave an example of a logistics company earlier, if a company is into the business of logistics, they can buy a software which is specialized in that field. The, uh, the company would find most of the operations over there, but sometimes uh, the core functions are there, but most of the other features which a company is practicing are not available in these software that you purchase off the shelf. Off-the-shelf software is cheaper and often more reliable than the proprietary software, but it may not meet the company needs as exactly because it is not made just like a proprietary software for you. So if you are running a, a educational institution and if you want to develop a registration system yourself, that would be a proprietary software for you because you have considered all the requirements of your system and the system is developed which can serve the purpose within that specific institution. Now there are several advantages and disadvantages of it as we can see proprietary software and off the shelf. So the advantage of a proprietary software is uh, you can get exactly what you need in terms of the features. Disadvantages, it can take time uh, and significant resources to develop it because you are developing it for that specific business type only. Uh, it is more profitable if you are making it for public and selling it, but if you are putting lots of resources, it would take time and the, uh, and the money which would be required or the resources in order to develop it. On the other side, if we have off-the-shelf software, the advantage is initial cost is lower because the software, um, because the software firm can spread the development cost over many customers, and then they can make profit on that. Disadvantages: an organization might have to pay for the features that are not required and will not be used. So you'll add the features over there. It's not necessary that they'll be using it or not. The other thing is being involved in the development on the offers the control over the results. So in proprietary software, you have all the control on the features and the things which are there. Disadvantages, it's in-house developed system. Uh, staff may be hard to find. And if in future you want to make any changes to that, it's difficult to um, uh, hold the staff with you. And if they leave, you might have a problem in modifying and updating the system. That's called the retention of the employees. Now, the advantage of off-the-shelf software is that the software is likely to meet the basic business needs. It will be available with the basic things which are required in a business. And the disadvantage is the software might lack important features, thus requiring the future modifications, etc. Now, if we talk about the proprietary software again, you can modify the features or needs whenever you want to do it. That's the advantage of it. Disadvantages, the features and the performance of the software that has yet to be developed present more potential risk because you'll have to check the overall security of the software as well. Of the of the shelf software, uh, its advantage is that the, back, uh, the package is uh, likely to be a, a high quality because many customer firms have tested the software and they are constantly updating the company if there are any possible uh, bugs in that. So the company would keep on improving the product. The disadvantage is the software might not match the current work processes and um, the data standards which the organization is using. 
Now that reminds us of uh, a thing which we have covered earlier as well, which is software as a service. There are lots of applications which we use online, uh, just to name a few, Office 365 is there, Salesforce is there, then we have different help desk facilities or the softwares available on the website. Now the beauty of those software is that you don't need to buy, you need to buy it, but you don't need to install it and to set it up in your organization. You'll buy a service and the service will be available on their servers. You'll pay for the subscription and it would be customized for your organization. So you'll be using the same software which other users are also using. But the data for your company and the employees, etc., would remain separate for you. So you can maximize the overall utilization of the software by uh, by the excellent set of features which are available on their website now after that we have some common applications that we use for day to day uh, um, processing in uh, processing the word documents spreadsheets databases graphics project management financial management etc so there are lots of applications available out there for word processing, databases, etc., graphics program. So as you can see, uh, Microsoft Word is the widely used uh, application since 90% of the computers in the world are using Windows. And since the uh, Microsoft Office is also released by Microsoft, so you can use these uh, set of applications which are known to be the best for their operations and everything. And it really helps in running most of our operations uh, quite smoothly in the Office environment. As you can see, we have word processing, spreadsheets, databases, graphics, project management, financial management, and desktop publishing. Now there are lots of programming languages available. Both operating system and application software are written in coding schemes, which are called programming languages. A programming language is a language which is used in order to develop or in order to uh, come up with a program. Uh, you might be developing some applications on Visual Basic, ASP, ASP.NET or PHP. It really depends what kind of organization or what kind of business it is and what is the main motive behind developing an application. Both operating system and application software are written in coding schemes called the programming languages. A programming language provides instructions to the computer system System so that it can perform uh, a processing activity. Information system professionals work with programming languages which are set to keywords, symbols, rules, syntax for example, conducting the statements by which the people can communicate instructions and execute by the computer. Uh, programming involves translating what a user wants to accomplish into a code that computer can understand and execute. So in order to understand the programming languages, just consider that you are using a database of uh, Oracle and you have a front-end application developed in PHP. Now if we are managing a student information system, the application which is developed in PHP would be talking to the database in order to perform different operations. For example, during the registration period when the students are adding courses, so all the details of the students, which courses they have registered, if the section is full or not, how many seats are available, uh, checking the core requisites, prerequisites, and all those other details would be handled by that uh, application which is developed in PHP and it would be sending that specific information to the database. On the other hand, if you want to get details about your grades, how many courses you have taken, what's your GPA, what's your cumulative GPA, what was the GPA of your previous semester and all those things, so you'll pass the query using that application and you'll get a perfectly fine, uh, perfectly developed and uh, uh, properly composed application. It would show you a, a report in front of you where you can get all the details related to uh, the query that you have passed. Now we are using different programming languages, for example, Visual Basic, which is useful for creating Windows applications and is quite quick. Then we have Java, which writes very, uh, which writes very portable programs and can be used for many different computers. We have C and C++, very pro uh, powerful programming language used to create uh, commercial software such as Windows, etc. Then we have assembly language used to create first efficient programs. And uh, um, um, programs are long and difficult for the humans to read. Few people can write in assembly language. It is not used that much, but um, is still a very efficient programming language. Then we have Prelog, a specialized language for creating the knowledge-based systems. 
So uh, the programming languages evolved over the passage of time. We have different generations for that. For example, first generation, second generation, third. And the programming languages which were released after 1980 are called the fifth generation languages. Now, these are the advanced languages through which we can develop natural and intelligent uh, programs using the fifth generation languages. Now we have software issues and trends, software bugs. Now software bugs are any problems or anomalies in any application that you are using. A software bug is a de defect in a computer program that keeps it from performing as it is designed to perform. Some software bugs are obvious and cause the program to terminate unexpectedly. Other bugs are you know, subtler and um, allow the errors to creep into the network. The computer and software vendors say that as long as the people uh, design and pro um, uh, the people design and program hardware and software bugs are inevitable. So, if they are developing the programs, uh, and these application errors and all those different kind of problems would always be, uh, remain over there. Now we have some problems related to the copyrights, etc. For example, copyrights and licensing uh, defines that the software is intended to be used uh, by the user who has purchased the license. Then there are licensing terms and conditions as well. For example, a single user license, a multi user license, concurrent license, or a site license. Single, license, single user license is meant to perform to be used by a single user. Multi-user license is usually purchased by a group of users like in your organization. If you want to use a software with all the employees, you'll be using a multi-user license. Then you have a uh, concurrent or a concurrent user license which is designed for the network distribution software. This license allows any number of users use the software but only a specific uh, number of users can use it at the same time. Then we have a site level license which permits the software to be used anywhere on a particular site in an organization such as a college or a campus or anywhere else on a site. Then we have uh, shareware or freeware or a public domain software. There are lots of software which are available for free. You can install it, you can use it. Some softwares are available where you can make the modifications to it. Uh, now lots of the uh, softwares are available in the market. For example, if we are using any um, uh, Firefox uh, browser, if we are using a Chrome browser, or um, if you are using Adobe Acrobat Reader, which is available for free in order to read the documents. But if you need to modify the documents, you'll have to purchase a license for that. We have free antivirus available like AVG. Uh, then we have anti-spyware uh, software, which is quite famous and free, which is called uh, Win Patrol. Then we have Irfan View, which is a photo editing software, which is free to use as well. When the softwares uh, uh, require certain upgrades, we call them software upgrades uh, because these are the upgrades which are released by the vendor. Sometimes these are the upgrades which are required uh, uh, to, uh, up, uh, to fix the problems in the software itself. The other times the new upgrade comes in with the modified features and all the, uh, all the problems which were there in the previous version, they are usually fixed in that. So here they are defining software upgrade when a software uh, companies stop supporting older software versions and release some customers feel uh, forced to upgrade to the newer version software. Deciding whether to purchase the newer software can be a problem for organization and people with a large investment in the software. First of all, sometimes um, there is no option. You'll have to upgrade the software just like uh, for Windows 7. They have, um, they have announced it that it's end of support, end of life. So uh, there will be no update patches and anything release for that operating system. So in order to uh, be protected, the organizations are, are forced to buy the latest operating system because the new operating system is coming with lots of other features and it would protect your organization since there will be constant updates from Microsoft. But in this kind of scenario, you'll have to keep in mind that the current applications which are used in the organization, uh, if they can work with the latest operating system or not. Now, the global software support means that it can adequately support to provide for all users in all locations. It means that regardless of the software, where you have purchased, where you have in, in installed it, you'll find a global support through their online channels and they'll be there in order to solve your problems and to tackle any issues which are specific to your organization. Now that brings us to the end of the chapter. Now in order to summarize, computer programs are sequence of instructions for, uh, for a computer. A system software coordinates the activities of hardware and programs. 
Application software helps the user to solve particular problems. Operating system is a set of computer programs that control the computer hardware and acts as an interface with application program. A graphical user interface uses an interface that uses icons and menus displayed on the screen to send commands to the computer system. Command-based system or command line interface uses type of commands at a prompt. Proprietary software is one of a kind program for a specific application, usually developed and owned by a single company. Off-the-shelf software are existing software programs that is purchased. And then we have a programming language which allows humans to communicate instructions to execute on a computer. Most software products are protected by law using copyrights or licensing uh, provisions, etc. And open source software is freely available to anyone in form that can be easily modified.